Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's raining today, but the, uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation. We have so many participants. So now we are going to start this um, uh, meeting co-organized by AIGCC and Clyde Colin Worth and supported by SNP Global on focusing on greenwash. So I'm on Hannah Heineken uh, from Client Earth. I'm going to be your master of ceremony today. So we provide simultaneous interpretation today. And you can see the channel uh, here. Uh, channel one is Japanese and channel two is English. So please um, use the simultaneous interpretation. We also provide the um, coffee, tea, and vegetarian and bento box. So please uh, feel free to uh, to it. So first of all, I'd like to call upon um, is Rebecca Mikola Wright, CEO of Investor Group on Climate Change and Asia Investor Group on Climate Change for uh, welcome remarks. Uh, good morning. I'm Rebecca Mikola Wright, but now I'm going to speak in English. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for, for getting up so early and coming to this event um, in a very busy week. Um, of PRI in Japan. Uh, it's really lovely to see you all here. I am the CEO of the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change and also the CEO of the Investor Group on Climate Change that covers Australia and New Zealand. Uh, welcome to this event for our uh, greenwashing guide and the, the launch of the Japanese translation of this guide. We actually released the English version of this guide several months ago, but this is our first in-person event. Um, so very pleased to be having this in Japan. Um, and we did have a lot of demand um, after the release of the report, a lot of interest from investors, uh, regulators across the region. Um, so really looking forward to the discussions here today. Also wanted to thank S&P Global for supporting this event today, um, a member of ours and a very important partner uh, for today's event. So we have some very important speakers here to discuss the to discuss the report and the implications of, of greenwashing. I um, wanted to have uh, Satoshi Ikerasan, um, the Chief Sustainable Finance Officer for the Financial Services Agency, who I'm sure you all know well, uh, to give some opening remarks. And then, of course, we'll hear from Client Earth to introduce the guide with a short presentation. And then we have um, the panelists who will discuss the guide in more detail. So for those of you who may not be familiar with AIGCC, um, we are an investor industry association uh, with over 70 investors uh, from across the investment value chain, uh, pension and government uh, funds, investment managers, and all the very important members uh, of the investment value chain. Uh, and we really connect um, and support investors to be active in their journey towards uh, net zero economies uh, globally. Uh, we cover 11 markets in Asia and have, have 20 staff now across the region, including here in Tokyo. So we, the, main puzzle, the main pieces of our work are investor practice, supporting investors, as I mentioned, uh, corporate engagement with companies across the region, and also engaging with policymakers and regulators on these issues so that we can really achieve real-world impact um, to address the risks and opportunities that climate change presents. In terms of our views on greenwashing, um, just some, some insights. So in the Australian context, um, the Senate in Australia earlier announced an inquiry into greenwashing across the economy, um, which may even um, lead to even stronger regulation. We're seeing quite strong uh, crackdowns from our regulator in Australia on corporates and investors. So greenwashing is very much um, on the minds of investors um, and all actors in the economy in the Australian market. South Korea has a draft anti-greenwashing bill expected to pass into legislation this year. And you'll hear more, obviously, more um, how greenwashing is being addressed across the region uh, through the panel. So 
greenwashing is, I'm, I'm going to sort of wrap up my comments, but greenwashing is a really tricky space to manoeuvre and I'm very glad to be having this conversation today and the conversations that you will have on how you are looking to navigate this, um, this issue. And I hope the report provides you with, you know, really some tools to think about your actions and the actions, you know, with, with the companies you engage with um, on how you can navigate this space. So I'm going to hand over to, um, you know, the experts to talk more about the report um, and let you listen to them. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to uh, Richard, um, Dr. Richard Matteson, who's the Vice Chair, S&P Global, Sustainable One, just to say a few words. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, it, it's so exciting to be here today to, uh, in such a full room, and I don't even think it's 8 o'clock yet. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit first about transition, because I think transition is a very complicated topic, and some of the elements of how we think about transition uh, lead to challenges when we talk about greenwashing. So I wanted to talk about transition first. The world has experienced many, many macro trends that have driven significant <laughs> wealth generation over the decades. You think about the 50s and 60s and globalization. You think about the trend for infrastructure inv investments leading to a new asset class. The technology boom and bubble and bust and now boom again. Generative AI today, peak earnings for Gen Z. All of these are investment megatrends. But I think one of the most exciting and largest investment megatrends has to be is thematic of the transition to a low carbon, sustainable and equitable future. It's gonna span decades, it's gonna be complicated, but, and it's gonna involve trillions of dollars of investment. And so that's exciting. I think, you know, as an investor, I'm very excited to identify opportunities in that trillions of dollars of shift of a global economy. This is the first time the world has tried to do this. An industrial revolution is a revolution. It's messy. What we're looking at is a transition that is an evolution. And we want it to be smooth. It's probably not going to be smooth, but, but that is the desire. But we have a set of goals that we're aiming for, and those goals are clear. So this is the first time there was no established goal for the technology boom, other than winning in the technology boom. So I think we have a huge opportunity. Um, but the transition is going to be complicated, and it's multifaceted and multidimensional. Ahead of Climate Week, uh, two weeks ago, the International Energy Agency announced that based on today's policies across all of the governments worldwide, even without any new policies, demand for each of the three fossil fuels, the three main fossil fuels, is set to hit a peak by 2030. So that's the first time that a peak has actually been visible for each of the fuels in this decade. That's remarkable. You go back five years and look at the same organization and those forecasts, it's a huge shift. Um, so what do we think at S&P Global? Well, we have built something called a global integrated energy model. It's based on a bottom-up analysis. It looks at five and a half thousand companies, uh, mostly energy and oil and gas companies. And it really is seeking to analyze transition in particular with respect to energy. What kind of shift are we gonna see? And our analysis would say that we estimate the share of fossil fuels will decline from about 80% today to 58% in 2050. Greenhouse gas emissions will fall by about 25%. And what I want to emphasize here is that is far short of where we need to be. That is a warming pathway of 2.4 degrees Celsius. So actually, that's the trajectory that we're on, is 2.4 degrees Celsius. And that, that, can, that can be a little depressing, uh, but we have a lot of hope because I think even the introduction of recent policies like the Inflation Reduction Act and GX strategy in Japan will make a huge difference and change that forecast quite significantly. Um, so three things to say about this forecast. Global net zero remains out of reach, um, but we must move urgently. And we, we think, actually, the second thing is uh, we think that uh, the, the projections have improved significantly since the last time uh, we did this, very significantly. And thirdly, um, public policies uh, are really going to drive the change, as well as uh, capital and the mobilization of the capital markets. 
and corporate action and innovation. So I just want to emphasize that renewables are the growth, sec uh, uh, the growth uh, story of the coming decade. Climate technology is hugely exciting. Um, and renewable power does grow multifold under every scenario that we have. So really the future is clean, it's green, and it's sustainable. That's the way we view it. But it will be challenging. And what will be challenging in particular is ensuring that we move in that trajectory without greenwashing. We move in that trajectory in a credible way. And so how do we do that? Well, you know, when I was in New York and uh, Singapore last week and, and in Tokyo this week, I heard from a lot of financial institutions what are some of the problems. And really, it kind of distills down to one critical question, which is how do you identify whether a company or a, pu a public policy or an asset that you might be seeking to invest in or a technology is genuinely going to aid in this quest for the transition? How do you identify a transition asset if you're a bank? How do you identify a transition company if you're an asset manager? Because the truth is, transition is the story that might actually mean emissions rise under certain scenarios before they fall. What you don't want is, though, for those emissions to rise and then continue to rise. And there will be organizations that will be on that trajectory, and there will be other organizations, more forward-looking organizations, that will be on the trajectory of a rise and then a decline. What we're not really seeing is many, many companies that are on a rapid decline today. So I think we, we really need layered intelligence to drive this change. And the way we look about this is actually what you need is data. So you need data on a clear analysis of the commitments of organizations to net zero and what does that actually mean? What are the long-term targets? What are the near-term or medium-term targets? You need to understand the emissions trajectory in the real world, not just, for example, at a portfolio level or a loan book level. You need to understand the emissions trajectory in the real world. You need to assess transition plans. What is the strategy? What is the capex? What is the opex? You need to assess technology pathways. What is the technology pathway for green hydrogen? Well, I can tell you that the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States has brought forward the cost curve reduction in green hydrogen by five years. That kind of analysis is critical. You need policy assessment. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, GX, uh, 150 trillion yen over the next 10 years is a huge and exciting opportunity. Um, and finally, but not least, it needs to be a just and inclusive transition. We need to make sure that we uh, are inclusive of um, populations in the global south, for example, inclusive from all aspects, and also inclusive of nature. Um, I'm a member of the TNFD, so I have to mention that, that nature is critically important and is a twin pillar of our quest to drive uh, improvement on climate change should also be ensuring that we um, make improvements from a nature perspective. So all of this is a balance and, uh, and, and an opportunity, I would say. But for example, when you're setting near-term targets, the way we think about this is if a near-term target needs to change, change it. Be brave and be bold and change it. Treat it as an earnings outlook. You wouldn't wait. If you knew your earnings were on the decline or increasing faster than you had previously publicly stated, you should update it and update the market. And we believe that climate change and transition is actually no different. It should be treated in exactly the same way as other financial forward-looking statements. Um, so, you know, transition, I think, is a huge opportunity. Um, it's an investment mega trend, and it's going to improve the lives of pretty much everyone on the planet. So we need to treat it seriously, uh, and I'm really hopeful that we can seize this opportunity. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Uh, next, I want to turn to um, our keynote, Mr. Satoshi Ikeda. Uh, from the Financial Services Agency. On the ice room. Uh, th th thank you for the introduction. Uh, well, um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, and this, I would like to thank the clients and the AIGC for organizing this event on this important topic of 
greenwashing. Um, certainly, greenwashing is uh, security is regulator's concern right now. And as Rebecca mentioned, that, uh, there's a certain move at the Australia and also a move in South Korea. And uh, Japan is not exception. Uh, well, uh, in terms of addressing greenwashing, we uh, recently uh, uh, released the uh, supervisory uh, guidelines on ESG funds, and the, it clearly states that the funds uh, who claims the uh, ESG in the investment activities, we said the significant, well, core component of the fund needs to be ESG related. And uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, um, after the release of that supervisory guideline, or even before, because a market anticipated that in incoming uh, regulation, uh, we see quite slowdown <laughs> of the issuance of uh, ESG funds in Japanese market. Uh, that's totally good news because uh, it clearly shows that the, our regulation uh, addresses a certain concern of greenwashing. But uh, as uh, Richardson mentioned, that uh, in functioning to net zero or functioning to sustainable economy, we need certain financial flaws to realize that future. And in that sense, well, for me, um, greenwashing challenges is, can, can, can be defined uh, in the way as the certain statistics, statistics tells, you know, that the, in the world in the statistics, there's a type one error and type two error. Type one error is uh, false, positive, so it detects something, in the case of this context, uh, something greenwashing. But truth, which actually not, not greenwashing. That's false, positive. And type two error, uh, it detects something not greenwashing, but it, which actually is. So we need to balance that kind of need that we properly address the true green washing, but not to be detrimental to the proper flow of finance to genuinely greening activities. Well, the reason I've said this is, um, well, uh, luncheon is a maybe evolution, <laughs> not revolution, but certainly uh, there are some uncertainties around transitioning to net zero. And certainly, uh, maybe there are some entities who wish to green their activities, but maybe short of competency. And the, in that case, maybe that entity continue to fail to deliver their pledge. And in that case, at what point it becomes greenwash? That is a very, that requires very fine judgment on the side of regulators. And the, uh, as, as again Richardson said, we certainly need to emulate what we do in the context of earnings, because there are certain earnings guide and certain earnings projection in three year time, earnings plan for the five years, 10 years, and if we look at that, those kind of things in earnings, well, we do not necessarily say that the 10 year plan must be exactly the same after 10 years. But uh, at certain point, the 10 year projection becomes a certain road for the uh, uh, market participants. So I really hope that the, the report, uh, the translated version, helps us uh, define greenwashing properly. And today's discussion will provide a 
very uh, uh, profound insight into this very difficult question, but the uh, uh, right question we need to ask for uh, sustainable uh, finance and for achieving the sustainable future. So thank you for this opportunity and domo arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you very much. Uh, so I really tried hard to speak in English. Thank you. Ikeda-san, domo arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Ikeda-san. Now, uh, moving on. Uh, from the client earth, we are going to have the introduction of the report. I'm Rafael Soffer. Very nice to be here today to present the report. Minasan, uh, um, I will try to summarize in uh, eight minutes a uh, 40 pages long report. So I will just give you some insights uh, about what I think are the main points. Um, I think what is. Oh. I'll hold it. So I hope everyone can hear me now. Um, so, yes, I will try to summarize very quickly this long report. Um, the, the, the main point I want to make first before going into a presentation of greenwashing and some regulatory observations um, is that we have tried to make a definition of greenwashing and explain which instruments uh, were regulating greenwashing. Uh, very few jurisdictions have a specific instrument specifically regulating greenwashing. There are a number of instruments uh, in, each, in each jurisdiction which are trying to grasp this context. So I think what we'll try to do quickly today is first to look at why it's important to look at greenwashing in the finance industry, give a quick definition, and then look at the different types of greenwashing and what regulators are doing about it everywhere. Um, and last, if I still have a minute, uh, the recommendation of the report. So we have uh, five pillars which we are giving in order to assess what uh, stakeholders uh, and actors uh, of the finance industry can do in order to avoid partaking in greenwashing. So the issue of greenwashing uh, in the finance industry is that it does have an impact on financial systems. Probably many years ago, people could think of greenwashing as something being innocuous. Uh, but it is not. It will result in the misallocation of capital, um, and it will result in an uneven playing field between companies. Um, and this is because actors uh, in the uh, sustainable finance value chain will be unable to make fair and accurate comparisons among the different types of products claiming to be green. Um, it is also so because the companies which are engaging in greenwashing have actually not incurred the cost associated with greening their products, while the companies which have incurred those costs are at a disadvantage. So overall, we believe at Client Earth and at IGTC that it will reduce investor confidence uh, in green products, inhibiting consumer uptake of green products, and it overall uh, will have a systemic impact uh, on, the, um, on green finance. At an individual level, um, greenwashing also can have an impact on companies uh, which are found guilty of greenwashing. Um, there can be fines from regulators of the jurisdiction. There can be damages uh, if corporations are being sued by their consumers or by their competitors or by their shareholders. Um, and of course, there is the damage uh, to their reputation, which is more hard to quantify, but which is real. So we have tried in the report to come with a Definition from greenwashing. Um, I think the one we have here is that it's a false, deceptive, or misleading statement uh, which is made about the nature and extent of the green qualities uh, to protect either the climate or the environment, or at least to have a neutral impact on the climate or the environment, while the product actually is either damaging to the environment or not having a positive impact. Uh, what is quite important is that there is absolutely no need for the company uh, to have a deliberate intent uh, to mislead in order for greenwashing uh, to be realized. Um, and I think what we try to do now, 
is to go a bit deeper into the four main types of greenwashing. So we have tried to do categorizations in the reports of the different types of greenwashing. Uh, so I think there are two main concepts in the report. Uh, one are the four types of greenwashing, and the other one uh, are the five main areas of regulation uh, which are used in order to regulate greenwashing. Um, I think we have a very limited time, so I will just remind that there is brand greenwashing, uh, the uh, greenwashing of financing, financial reporting greenwashing, and product greenwashing. An example of brand greenwashing, uh, which many of us will have heard about in the finance industry, for instance, uh, there, there was this major bank which made ads uh, in the UK, uh, which was explaining uh, that it was spending trillion uh, to protect the environment, but the UK advertising authority uh, found that actually it was not sufficient, uh, sorry, that the bank had not indicated uh, in its advertisement that there was also some other aspects of its business and that it was not actually Paris aligned. And the authority found that this was a material omission and have asked to remove um, those advertisements uh, from um, bus stations uh, in the UK. Um, so this had a reputational impact, obviously, and the bank was actually spending uh, those billions uh, for the financial, for the transition, um, but it still had to present the other side uh, of its business, uh, which was not Paris aligned. So that's brand greenwashing, and that's an ever-going uh, danger uh, for institutions. The other one I want to quickly speak about is the financing of greenwashed assets. Um, I think the most obvious one, which we almost don't see anymore now, is very simply uh, to, for a financial uh, institution to lend monies to an, a corporation uh, which will use those proceeds for a non-green purpose, even though those monies are being lent for uh, green purposes. So that's the most obvious, which we don't see anymore. But what we can still see uh, is something which is a little bit more tricky, and I think the panel will speak about it, uh, is when a lender is providing corporate financing for a high emission company, which has uh, some green projects, and the financing are being um, loaned in order to finance some green projects, but actually the company is still expanding its fossil fuel production, for instance, or still has an increasing um, uh, project with, with related to fossil fuels, for instance. Um, I think when we continue on the gradation, uh, we can also look at transition finance, uh, where there is a bank providing transition finance to a emission company, but the emission path is actually not Paris aligned. Uh, so it could also be called greenwashing um, in that case. So here, uh, the slide for the more visual people, so you can see the different um, moments in the life of a greenwashing uh, financial product, of a greenwashing financial product. So first on the left, it starts uh, by the real economy, uh, where you can see a product um, or a company which is greenwashing its product, and then a financial institution uh, either through loans or through a fund, uh, is actually making claims about those products. Uh, so either reproducing the claim uh, because it has failed to, sorry, it has failed to exercise adequate scrutiny uh, or because it's adding, you can see on the right, uh, its own green claims. So you can end up with a financial product which actually has been doubly greenwashed. Um, next frontiers of greenwashing. So, I think there are quite a few. Um, we will speak about transition washing in a second, so maybe another one which is a green washing via offsets, uh, which is when a financial product marketed as green is actually wholly reliant on carbon offsets. So in other words, it has actually no real benefit uh, for the climate or the environment. I think on time, I have to finish very quickly. So extremely quickly, uh, the point I was making at, at the beginning, uh, which was about the absence uh, in most jurisdictions of a specific instrument targeting greenwashing. So what we have tried to do uh, is to divide into five main parts uh, for the Asian jurisdictions. Um, where are the regulatory fields uh, where investors uh, should look at in order to find the information in order to avoid uh, any greenwashing? Uh, so there is a disclosure and reporting, climate taxonomy, 
project for labeling, green rating criteria, and net zero integrity. Net zero integrity uh, being this report uh, published by uh, the UN. Um, so, because we're in Japan, and I think uh, Satoshi Kedasan already presented very quickly uh, some of the greenwashing regulations applicable to uh, companies um, issuing securities in Japan. Um, I think here. Yes, uh, so we already had a very quick presentation of the uh, new guidelines, uh, which have been revised this year, uh, which are explaining that any um, security issuer uh, which is using the word ESG or green, ESDG or another similar word in the name of the phone actually has to use, ha has to use ESG as a key factor in the creation and the administration of that phone. Otherwise, this is obviously greenwashing. Uh, there have also been uh, the Ministry of Environment of Japan, uh, which has issued guidelines um, explaining uh, what are the main requirements uh, in the case of issuance of green bond or green loans. And I think we should also salute uh, the Code of Conduct uh, for ESG Evaluation in Data Providers issued by the FSA. Uh, last year, that's the world first, uh, and it's also something which is extremely positive. And I think I'm really late. Um, so we have five pillars in the guide, um, and I would really recommend uh, in particular uh, to, to the investors uh, in the room to, to look at those five pillars. Um, th the idea is to take a look at the practices of um, marketing a financial product from every angle and to think not only from a regulatory perspective about which rules are applicable to it, but also to think about updating in permanence uh, the um, review of this product, something which may have not been greenwashed five years ago, may today be considered to be greenwashed. Regulations may have evolved, perceptions may have evolved. Uh, what is quite important is to look at how different audiences are perceiving a product and a particular green claim. Um, so we have all of those recommendations. It's a few pages long, and I, I really recommend reading this part in particular. Um, and I think I will stop here because we are extremely late. Thank you so much. Uh, may I ask the panelists to come up to the stage, please? Great, we're gonna uh, start our panel discussion. I'm gonna speak in English, um, but uh, I think most of the panelists will speak in Japanese. Um, so have your uh, translation, interpretation devices handy. Um, and I wanna pick up on the presentations uh, and facilitate a few questions uh, to the panelists. Um, I want to start with uh, one round of questions for everyone here. Um, we've heard that regulators and financial professionals and legal um, experts are in general agreement that greenwashing is on the rise, um, which coincides with the increasing desire for greener products, greener financial products. Um, the report identifies a couple types of greenwashing, and a question for all of you is, what are you most concerned about and why? Um, maybe I'll start actually with Ikeda-san. <laughs> which type? Uh, it's kind of difficult to identify which type. 
And from the uh, standpoint of uh, regulators, you know, those uh, that are easy to identify um, are there. The, if it's the product greenwashing, um, about that product, the um, it was not really an ESG, but the uh, it is labeled as ESG, and we see many such cases. But if you compare the products, then uh, it's easy uh, for you to identify. Of course, uh, some of the products uh, may be more difficult to identify and tricky. And this report uh, says that the uh, brand green washing. When you look at the activities of each individual on a company, um, you know you may have some uh, doubts. But in total, uh, the companies may be doing uh, good activities. So in such case, it's very difficult uh, to identify. And I think all type of greenwashing is important. Miyake-san? Thank you. I do not necessarily come from the uh, financial um, industry, so I would like to take a look at this question from a wider point of view. And the Iketa-san uh, talked about the uh, easiness to identify as greenwashing or not. But when it comes to brand greenwashing, I think it's it's a difficult one, and also. We often see the cases where the uh, you know the, the TV commercials uh, there are certain claims. Um, it's not necessarily the uh, uh, financial products, but the when it comes to a company, um, you know, the the companies may be making efforts uh, towards uh, that claim. So in such case, how do you define the um, brand image from those activities? Um, and also, But it's also very difficult if we have to deal with the TV commercials uh, for the public um, audience, for example. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I, uh, uh, you know, it's okay. But I tend to uh, take a look at this issue from the consumer perspective. So when it comes to involving consumers in this area, I think it's very important. This brand uh, washing uh, type is very important. Onozuka san, Onozuka san, please. The same question. So I'd like to introduce myself because uh, some people are new to me. So uh, I have been an institutional investor in the past 20 years, and I am independent right now, providing advice to companies and uh, uh, listed companies and unlisted companies. I am a board member of many such companies. Uh, therefore, I take a look at this issue from a, a variety of perspectives. So yes, it is a, a very difficult uh, question. But when it comes to financial products, and um, I am the external director of asset management company, so in terms of uh, financial product greenwash, I think um, this is, um, yes, if I am to pick just one, uh, yes, um, the highest concern is on financial product uh, greenwash. Because um, financial institutions if there is a greenwash, this means that there is a momentum for green finance. So green finance is progressing. Therefore, we would like to maintain this uh, momentum. This means that we have to understand the fiduciary duty, and then uh, based on that, uh, they need to manage. That way, therefore, financial institution greenwash, and also the way they go through the process and uh, what is the philosophy of such company, and then uh, what about the labeling of uh, such financial product, and what about the investment judgment. I think uh, these are all very important. Therefore, I would like to um, yes dig deeper uh, on this topic later on. Well. Good morning. Well, um, at this point in time, I would say that uh, climate change uh, information disclosure greenwash is uh, what I am looking at. So disclose the GHG emissions, and that's not correct, or um, disclosure being insufficient. And financed emission, um, financial institutions say that uh, they are actually working on that, but they are actually uh, making investment into fossil fuel projects, and uh, they are not uh, um, avoiding the risks uh, of 
uh, loans and investments in such fossil fuel projects. And right now, climate change disclosure, we now have standards. Uh, we don't necessarily have uh, standards for climate uh, disclosure. Therefore, the disclosed information may differ from company to company. In securities reports, sustainability information now needs to be incorporated, and uh, that now has to be incorporated. But as of now, as for climate change actions, the actual uh, contents that are to be disclosed, uh, they are not really standardized. And uh, in for um, the last fiscal year, 2022, a disclosure started. But uh, a big financial institutions, if you look at the uh, climate information disclosure in terms of GHG emissions, some of those uh, big corporations are not really showing uh, any targets and uh, any actual emission numbers. And uh, um, scope one, two may be covered, but finance emissions are not. Others um, also cover financed emissions. So if you look at uh, those integrated reports or financial reports, uh, they are required. So if there are some false information, uh, there is a legal liability there. And the hurdle for the litigation, um, damage litigation hurdle is quite low for such uh, false information. We haven't seen such cases yet in Japan, but uh, overseas, uh, New York City, ExxonMobil being sued by New York City. So there are certain legal cases there already. And NGOs, they may bring the court cases or uh, try and raise some social awareness uh, through the litigation. So I think uh, there is a risk for the companies. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Onozuka-san if you could elaborate on the what could be the root cause of greenwashing um, for financial firms? Are they trying to please different audiences? What's going on? Different audience, you know, are I think so. Yeah, they are trying to please different audiences. I have been in asset management industry for a long time. So how to increase the asset and also a remuneration or fee cooperation um, it's, it's not easy to accumulate uh, the uh, fee. Fee by asset, that is uh, the, the uh, profit. Therefore, trendy uh, products and catchy labeling to increase the asset volume overall, that can work as an incentive for financial institutions. So such force is at play. And as has been mentioned in the report, what is being tested is integrity of such cooperation. Um, corporations are established under different philosophy or purpose. And uh, uh, becoming a super green um, alone is not the ultimate purpose of a company. When it comes to a financial institution, what is the philosophy of the company? And as I am aware, some financial institutions, um, they may suffer increase of the emissions uh, for, some t for some time, but uh, they can move towards uh, the uh, uh, less uh, emitting portfolio going forward. Therefore, they may not sign up uh, with some pledges or initiatives. And I think this uh, report is uh, formulated in a very nice way. So thank you for writing up this report. I think page. Um, I think page seven, starting from page seven, and we have types or typology of greenwash, uh, different categories, and uh, HSBC uh, financial institutions, what they have done, and so on and so forth is being introduced. And I'd like to give you some side stories because you are here from early morning, and Goldman Goldman Sachs um, asset management being fined. Page eighteen. This is a fine being imposed on Goldman Sachs. I was not there. But then when this process was underway, I was at Goldman Sachs Asset Management, and I actually observed this process. So what was happening is that ESG is a good thing, so we have to integrate ESG. So that was the thinking of the company, and they tried hard to do that. But on the other hand, it wasn't as if um, they wanted to go ESG all out. 
And as a result of that, they were fined. So I think、uh, we are on the watershed moment right now. In the past, there was no expertise. We didn't know the regulatory framework. And then companies were just doing what they believed to be good. But then now we have those examples and we have more expertise. And the question is whether you really want to do greenwash or not. So, the company, the product, and also the management integrity is now being tested. So, I think we are at that moment that we have to draw a line between these two questions. Incredibly valuable.、Um, I want to turn to Miyake san.、Um, you were a member of the high level expert group,、um, the UN high level expert group on net zero commitments of non state actors. Um, which、uh, the Integrity Matters report, I think, is very important.、Um, do you find any notable differences or gaps in the greenwashing debate in Japan and other countries? Thank you very much for that question. So,、um, in seven months, we、uh, put together the report of this.、Um, High level expert group. So, we had a really intense discussion at that time. And for the first several months, what I thought was、uh, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN, he said that、uh, we have to address this issue of greenwash. So, this was the awareness of the problem. And then the title of the report said that uh, uh, what constitutes net zero. And then we discussed. What constitutes net zero? And what was the biggest gap between Japan and the rest of the world? And then、uh, this is a rule of thumb,、uh, which is a basic thing, which is that、uh, whether this is 1.5 degrees or not, at the end of the day,、uh, what is being asked is whether it is aligned to 1.5 degrees or not. And what does that mean? That is not really being discussed in Japan. And maybe not just in Japan, globally, such a discussion is still short or lacking. So, what it means to be aligned with 1.5 degrees, that is not fully discussed in Japan. And、uh, if you are not aligned with 1.5 degrees, well, you may be accused of being greenwashed or、uh, you are not、uh, on the pathway anyway. And uh, uh, whether uh, your pathway is right or not, That is based on whether you are aligned with 1.5 degrees or not. And of course, this is a difficult discussion. We don't have all the data from all the sectors,、uh, science based. That's not the world where we, we live in. So it's not easy. But then we have to go closer, at least, and discuss how to get closer. And for that purpose, what kind of data is needed, how to compare such investigation, such research has to be done. So, that is the current situation in Japan. So,、um, our response to greenwash, in that sense, also, I think we should stick to that philosophy or idea. I think that is a kind of the rule of thumb we are following right now.、Um, turn to regulation.、Um, and maybe a question for、uh, Ikeda san. The, in terms of the regulatory measures that Japan has. Passed a couple years ago or even recently.、Um, you mentioned the ESG fund、uh, rule, but either that one or, or others, what has been some of the more effective,、um, impactful measures、uh, that you have passed in your view? Right. Well,、um, <laughs> it is very difficult to figure out which measure、uh, was impactful in terms of addressing greenwashing. Um, rather, I would say、uh, we are trying to construct a certain ecosystem for addressing greenwashing. So it requires the layers of regulations to address that.、Uh, as、uh, Kobayashi-san said, well, the, there needs to be a certain level of scrutiny to the sustainability reporting. So that is why we are moving towards mandatory sustainability reporting rules. Uh, as Kobayashi-san said,、uh, we made mandatory the sustainability reporting already, but we have not specified which standards the company should abide by in reporting sustainability issues. So, well, we have taken a certain gradual step, but、uh, we aim to specify standards 
uh, in line with ISSB. So that is the kind of direction of travel that the Japanese regulators taking. And the, not only you know, those reporting issues, well, in, in every single act of, uh, you know, well, kind of advertising the greenness of the uh, 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 activities. Um, well, there needs a certain level of scrutiny uh, at the inter internally at the uh, entity level. So, uh, and well, again, in producing certain financial reports uh, or providing a certain earnings guide, there are certainly you know, steps to be taken to make sure that those numbers are genuine, correct, and reliable. We need to establish an ecosystem that the you know, claim of greenness will become, uh, uh, you know, will uh, be treated in the same way as we treat earnings. So uh, I think that is uh, basically the direction of travel that uh, you know, well, uh, regulators around the globe are taking, I believe. And the, actually, the certain categorization of uh, uh, greenwashing in this report, I believe certainly corresponding to the uh, needs of certain regulation. So, uh, so um, well, for the brand greenwashing, we will require certain governance and internal control system for uh, 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 claiming greenness. Uh, for financial reporting greenwashing, uh, we will introduce a mandatory reporting system for sustainable issues, so, 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 so on and so forth. So, um, so we need a certain layers of uh, regulation to address greenwashing, and the, well, that is still in progress for completion, uh, but uh, uh, it, it certainly uh, uh, the trend that we are taking. But at the same time, well, I'd like to add, but uh, at the same time for the investor side, uh, you should not be too naive <laughs> to believe that, uh, you know, well, because, um, well, I, I, even if uh, earnings figure was is produced with that kind of level of scrutiny, there are certain occasion for the revising that the earning forecast. So they need to be a certain kind of, well, uh, 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 sense of uh, 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 suspicion, and, I mean, uh, uh, and the sense of caution on the side of investor. And uh, not so much surprised when that uh, you know certain revision made for the certain green claims. Of course, that will uh, uh, you know uh, keep some investor of the, uh, investing in that particular entity. But that is a natural force of the market equilibrium. So uh, well, I hope that the, you know green claim will be treated in the same way as earnings or earning forecast. And that is uh, probably the uh, proper function of the market in the end. Thank you. I love the ecosystem of regulation um, and the need for uh, diligence. Um, Kobayasan, can you provide some scenarios where a financial institution could potentially be held uh, liable under current Japanese laws in connection with greenwashing? In relation to greenwashing and the scenario in which the financial institutions are held liable, there are three major cases. One is that the uh, and by providing finance to greenwashing uh, companies and helping ultimately uh, greenwashing uh, of those companies, if the investors do not know uh, such things, then they can be uh, part of the victims. But if the uh, security company uh, do not uh, conduct their due diligence of the product and then sell that a uh, green bond to uh, retail inve uh, retail um, investors and then and when it's become clear that the uh, this product uh, does not have any greening uh, 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 function and then the 
securities companies, uh, since they are uh, selling the products uh, to the retail investors, uh, they may be held uh, liable under the uh, uh, Financial Instrument and Exchange Act. And the second is the uh, um, financial institution themselves uh, create uh, products uh, that may be uh, um, held liable as greenwashing. Um, and the um, administrative actions uh, from the uh, FSA uh, may be taken. And uh, we still have not uh, had any um, the uh, clear standards uh, in dealing with such uh, cases. However, the, um, if the prospect of the product uh, set, uh, uh, um, uh, creates the expectations that the uh, you know uh, certain uh, green activities will be uh, conducted or uh, you know serve the purpose of the greenness, but the, uh, if uh, it's find out that it's not the case, then the uh, uh, securities companies may be held uh, uh, liable. And in terms of the reporting, on. Um, for example, integrated reporting, and, uh, there will be increased um, possibilities uh, for litigation. And based on the Companies Act, the um, the uh, shareholders may, uh, you know, bring some litigations uh, to um, hold the uh, board members uh, accountable. Barisan just uh, offered. Um, on the, just kind of looking forward, um, in terms of any advice to financial institutions who want to limit their exposure to greenwashing risks, um, Ikeda san, you, you touched on this in your earlier remarks, but if there's anything to add, I want to start with you um, and then maybe go down the line. So, this is Yes, so, as I said before, Securities reports, um, you know, as Kobersan said, on, uh, accompanied with some responsibilities and liabilities. So we have that legal framework. So under that, each individual uh, financial institutions and some companies uh, must conduct the due diligence of the numbers, uh, which will be put into those reports. And um, on the same level, the the same level of scrutiny will be required in terms of uh, greenwashing. But as I said before, in the beginning, uh, that was the intention, maybe, but especially with financial institutions, the investee companies' actions um, are also required. And uh, that if there is no progress on that side, so in such a case, how do you um, provide the updated information to the market? And that's where the, a certain level of integrity is requir required of financial institutions. So as I said, uh, the revising the earning forecast, uh, the Japanese companies are, are especially reluctant uh, in, in, to do that. Uh, but the, uh, I think companies should not be afraid of uh, making revisions and it should make full explanation of these are the reasons why uh, we were not able to uh, achieve such and such. And this kind of continuous uh, efforts are needed, I think. Yes, uh, I would like to mention two things. Of course, financial products, um, those uh, companies are producing financial uh, products, so what can they do and how they should avoid greenwashing? I think the uh, level of the knowledge needs to be enhanced because uh, um, they don't really intentionally want to do wrong things. I, I do believe so. It's just because they don't know. Uh, therefore, unintentionally, uh, they do greenwashing. That is in uh, many cases. Of course, uh, they shouldn't... Uh, um, uh, just uh, uh, be um, freed um, without being uh, uh, accused. But I think it's very important for them to have more knowledge to begin with. 
So what often happens in Japan is that according to Japanese rules, and uh, this is the uh, common sense in Japan, so the kind of the uh, common sense or matter of the facts uh, in Japan, oftentimes uh, uh, Japanese companies cite those things. But the climate issues and climate challenges that uh, they employ global international language, universal language. Therefore, um, information disclosure needs to be in line with the international standards. And uh, the uh, facts actually change. Uh, the answers today may not be the answers in five years. So that can be a difficult issue. Therefore, the facts need to be updated. And then, uh, based on the current facts, uh, they have to produce the financial products. And another one is, um, I don't really have a financial ec uh, background so much. Uh, I was working for a retail uh, company, and it was the same. Uh, there was the uh, kind of a labeling uh, law, and oftentimes companies uh, can be punished because of what they claim is different uh, from what they actually sell. And of course, uh, producers of the product, they have to be careful, but uh, I think uh, education on the part of the consumers is also important. Consumers or those who buy the product need to be able to have enough uh, knowledge uh, to make a judgment whether uh, what they are purchasing is green or not. So I think it's uh, both ways, knowledge on the producer side as well as on the consumer side. So such a, um, a continuation of the education uh, is required in order for us to move towards the right direction. So yeah, I am uh, relieved uh, that uh, I uh, come after Ikeda-san and Miyake-san, and I can't agree more. And let me just uh, uh, refer uh, back to uh, this guidance, uh, page 27. Uh, so um, uh, integrity and green. And on 29, uh, walk that green talk. So I think uh, philosophy of the company and the action of the company need to be aligned. And in the financial industry, I think uh, the scrutiny or due diligence of uh, the products, investment product, is very important um, because as things change, they have to um, handle uh, very complicated data. And also PRI, responsible investment, active ownership is also very important uh, to have active engagement even after purchasing or making investment. And also consumer education, and uh, if you think about financial ed education, we often talk about the NISA, that is the Japanese system, so kind of encouraging consumers to make investment. But uh, whether a certain investment is greenwash or not, we need to raise the awareness on the part of the consumers so that the consumers will shift uh, from saving to investment. So we need to have such momentum and the positive awareness raising activity activities are needed. So uh, rather than making the consumers afraid of making investment, we need to go positive. And in terms of expertise or knowledge, oftentimes Japanese financial institutions, they uh, want to enclose uh, all the information and uh, um, they try and educate their full-time employees, but then it takes time. And uh, uh, things are changing uh, very quickly. Therefore, uh, those financial institutions need to talk to lawyers or NGOs, those expert knowledge that is available outside of the company and organization. So that's something needed. And finally, in terms of supervision of the financial services uh, agency, and I'd like to disclose one personal uh, story. I spent 20 years at Goldman Sachs, and then uh, I was responding to auditing. And uh, those auditing, uh, it's planned. So uh, it's not as if uh, uh, all of a sudden your product is being accused of uh, doing wrong things. So uh, the company's uh, track record, the company's uh, usual practice, all of these uh, matter. And then uh, whether the ESG investment uh, this time around is the right thing or not, that is the question being asked. So it's not just uh, uh, the question of uh, greenwashing. I think the financial institutions need to upgrade themselves in general. So um, that is something that uh, where I would like to make further contribution to. So what I think is uh, very important is uh, 
appropriate disclosure, not just their financial report, uh, security is the reporting, but uh, more broadly speaking, disclosure is the most important thing. Uh, so a reasonable enough amount of information and that uh, uh, is good for uh, investment judgment, I think that is being required of. But then uh, three things you have to be mindful of. One thing about disclosure is that uh, things are changing very quickly around disclosure, not just uh, um, Japanese laws and regulations, but then international organizations, they come up with uh, new standards, and you have to uh, always uh, uh, keep pace with such development. ESG world, things are changing very quickly, so you may not be able to keep pace. Therefore, you have to look at the standards, soft law, soft law of international organizations. And um, I think those market participants are trying to come up with best practices. Um, because they are soft law, um, observe, not observing them, uh, do not constitute a legal violation right away, but then they are best practices. So as long as you observe those best practices, I think uh, uh, financial institutions are, are being considered to fulfill uh, required responsibility. Now, talking about the data provided by a uh, third party as a gatekeeper, uh, financial institutions should not simply uh, trust and believe uh, the uh, data that is provided by a third party, they have to scrutinize such data, or uh, just uh, cherry picking the data that is convenient for the uh, financial institution that has to be avoided. And then a third party provided data and um, what are the assumptions of the data and the limitations of the data, all such needs to be disclosed. And the data provided by a third party, uh, financial institutions are not scrutinizing the data directly. So um, oftentimes uh, they incorporate a disclaimer saying that uh, the integrity of the data is not their responsibility. But if the data is inaccurate clearly, and if the financial institutions uh, think that, that the data is uh, wrong or mistaken, and if they are aware of it, then, even if uh, there may be disclaimer, uh, they will still be accounted for. And talking about the future um, uh, uh, um, proactive uh, statement, of course, um, this means uncertainties always attached. Therefore, uh, it doesn't right away constitute false information. But it doesn't mean that uh, you can just write about anything about the future, because that way you lose confidence in disclosure. Therefore, if you'd like to talk about the future, you need to have reasonable assumptions that there. And uh, what are the uh, assumptions there and uh, what they think? about the future, uh, they need to clearly disclose that. And after the revision of the disclosure guidelines, um, important uh, future information that can impact the uh, investment judgment, if that is not included intentionally, then uh, that can be considered false uh, statement. So that is now written in the guidelines, so companies need to be careful with that. And then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. Um, this question of transition finance, and I wanna apply um, the conversation we've just had on um, the transition finance and, and the kind of emergence of this, not only in Japan, but globally. Um, the, so obviously the, the Financial Services Agency in Japan and, and METI um, and uh, the Ministry of Environment have put out various guidance um, on this matter, um, directing the most recent guidance um, directs financial institutions to follow up with the transition finance fundraisers where, I quote, assumptions underlying the transition strategy change, um, including where progress against transition objectives falls short of what was expected during fundraising. So a question for, for all of you, starting with Ikeda-san, is um, what is your view on how investors should approach the follow-up dialogue um, with these fundraisers um, where there's a failure to achieve meaningful progress against their transition strategies, um, particularly where there's 
for example, an assumption um, in relation to uh, reliance on technologies? Uh, thank you for that very difficult uh, question. Um, <laughs> well, um, I would say when well, some entity fails to uh, deliver the results according to their commitment, well, you know, outright kind of uh, denial or, 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 or of any uh, continued provision of finance to uh, so such entity, uh, uh, maybe too harsh, but well, it it it, it depends. But uh, 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 I would say uh, the uh, uh, the willingness to take a corrective action for the failure, and the the uh, well, uh, the likelihood of the you know well achieving that uh, corrective action, and uh, and the well, uh, so th th those factors also should. Uh, be taken into account in deciding the the, co co the continuation of the provision of finance to such entity and the well of the case um, it's a very difficult decision uh, but uh, I think um, um, well the it is a uh, um, matter of uh, uh, trust so it, it, it requires the um, I think the collaboration uh, uh, between the financial side and the, the finance side and the well and the as I repeatedly said uh, uh, the if the financial side cannot convince itself that the uh, a commitment, or kind of revised commitment, corrected commitments uh, 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 by the finance side uh, uh, can be uh, 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 trustful uh, uh, in terms of the uh, kind of other uh, 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 metrics such as you know the commitment to earn something or deliver certain earnings and other types of uh, 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 metrics, uh, uh, I think the those kind of other factors and the, the greenness claim claims yeah, will be probably important. So uh, with well getting a well relevant information for judging the kind of genuinity trustfulness of the finance side, and the and there's this well reasonable ground to believe that uh, uh, corrective action will be truthfully implemented in the future, then I think, uh, well, uh, that financier should continue that uh, provision of finance. If not, uh, probably should stop. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, a very kind of uh, fine, uh, very uh, uh, subtle judgment. So, uh, uh, I cannot say with a uh, uh, high level of confidence that uh, in this case, this should be done or this should not be done, but uh, a general principle that is uh, basic, uh, uh, that, uh, that basic guidance that would guide the uh, action by the financial institution. Thank you for, for first being the first up to answer the, the difficult question. Um, maybe Miyake-san, from your perspective as a uh, financial industry, um, what would give you kind of reasonable confidence um, on these matters? Basically, um, I agree with uh, what uh, Ikeda-san said, uh, but one is transparency. Uh, transparency is uh, what it matters. Um, the commercial readiness and so forth, uh, technologies, of course, and, and there are uncertainties about technologies. No one knows for sure. So there is no absolute um, you know, confidence in any technology. So um, that is why we, you need to challenge. However, the, the result of that challenge 
uh, needs to be judged with transparency, with data that backs that up. And the that uh, data should be disclosed uh, with a great deal of transparency. That's one. And before it starts, escalation strategy is needed. You know, uh, you know, to what extent uh, you can go um, providing the finance, but at certain level, then you exit. And, and so you need to have this escalation strategy. Of course, you need to challenge um, uh, to what extent you can go. However, of course, uh, there are cases where uh, things don't go well. So if you have the agreement uh, prior to um, starting the uh, financing, um, and then uh, you can feel um, uh, uh, relaxed about, you know, uh, to this extent, you can continue to challenge and you can continue to work with the um, investing company. So uh, the agreement on the conditions about um, the exit uh, is very important. Uh, from the viewpoint of investors, the investors uh, should be responsible in doing their job. Um, I think that's that's what really matters. For example, a passive manager who invests in the uh, entire uh, market uh, so that the entire market can be improved, there's one, and the un other uh, stock pick asset managers. And the passive manager, in terms of the equities, and they can't sell. So they continue to invest in that entity uh, uh, until that company uh, exits from that index. So what the managers can do in such a situation is that the stewardship activities while you are making the investment in that companies, and you raise the level of the um, in, uh, engagement. And actually, two years ago, and I was in a panel discussions with uh, such a manager, and uh, that manager was saying that the um, when the uh, exposure didn't move at all, then uh, they said that the, uh, they are also uh, seeing some um, shareholder proposals. So the escalation tools like this one should be used. And of course, they should not be afraid of uh, utilizing such tools, and that's my expect expectation of institutional investors. And also, another is the divestment. Of course, um, if you um, judge that the investing companies will not be really improving at all, then you can divest. You know, and that means that the other companies. Um, uh, 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 financing cost will increase, right? So um, earlier, um, I was uh, trying to speak more about the encouraging aspects, and that's my expectation too. But what we need in Japan is that the capitalist should you know, have the pride as capitalists and um, act um, with that prize um, in a practical way. Another one is the science, which um, attracts a lot of attention. And also data also attracts a, a lot of attention. In this field, financial institutions um, have not really uh, had um, a really high antenna to catch, you know, the um, information. And I think in Individually, I think that the, uh, this is the area where the in financial institutions should work more, and the science. Um, so the, and I have been uh, running this at NGO, uh, which combines the finances and the uh, science. And for the science side, um, you know what needs to be. Um, uh, uh, found out in order to, um, you know, improve the entire thing. So this kind of collaboration between scientists and financial institutions is needed. For transition financing that actually leads to carbon lock-in um, and increase in carbon emissions, uh, do you have any warnings for the audience? Hello, transition finance. Um, uh, transition finance. Uh, there is no, you know, you know, intrinsic nature of transition finance. The 
uh, it's a finance uh, to the transition uh, strategies of the company. So when you start financing, and uh, there are, you understand uh, the strategies uh, which involve some uncertainties about the technological uh, future, of course. And so you have to uh, do some challenging act. But when situation changes, uh, you need to um, act in accordance with such changes. And it's a long-term story. And, and the uh, financial institutions have to have that in mind. And uh, at the entering point, financial institutions institutions um, do need to understand this is the uh, uh, present best guess, but yeah, we are going to conduct the uh, future monitoring in such a way, and this kind of thing should be um, explained to the investee companies. And then and the monitoring uh, should be conducted in line with the monitoring plan, and then the uh, prior uh, um, proactive engagement uh, should be uh, conducted with the uh, issuers. And um, if these are followed, up, followed, and I think there is no, uh, you know, big concern about the transition finance. It's going to take uh, one or two questions from the audience. Okay, I see a hand that just went up. Um, is someone able to be able to take? A Please uh, wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you very much. It's a, a very great uh, pleasure for, uh, for me to uh, participate in this very significant uh, seminar. In fact, it's an excellent report. I first appreciate uh, your work, very uh, good work, in fact. Um, the, I was uh, uh, researching in human security, in fact, and then from this point of view, uh, this uh, uh, greenwashing is also quite uh, important for the future of the human security. So uh, my concern is uh, actually the um, how uh, we can just uh, trace for this uh, um, uh, the, this is a wash or not. It's not so easy to decide the timing or the how you can see the uh, uh, eyesight with scope because uh, this is an ecosystem. It's not only the one part. This totally you have to uh, consider. So in this sense, I agree the science is important. Uh, not only the um, natural scientists, but also kind of a, uh, anthropological, economical, or historical things. Because human beings are involved in this sense. So we have to understand what a human being, especially the grassroots level. The, the 1.5 percent, that's OK for the global sense. But the, you know, the people are living in the field and different impact, of course. So vulnerable people, refugees, these are also one of the most uh, concerned in this process. So some sort of a graduation and the policy must be implemented really practically. Otherwise, just kind of a, another corruption or another laundering uh, really possible. So you say, how about the strategy for, uh, you said just a monitoring. Maybe it's monitoring is one of the key. So how to feedback for any sort of idea for the kind of complaints and uh, such kind of even the regulator is uh, limited. So how the, maybe the consumers or the investors should be also known then how to get action, reaction. So we have so, to take do. So I want to know the how to the some kind of mechanism for that, or okay. the or complemental. Uh, thank, uh, you. Just, thank you. Um, maybe just uh, anybody have a quick answer um, to that question? Uh, I think the um, well connection between the uh, greenwashing and the uh, uh, human security. Um, I think the kind of level of influence that uh, uh, entities or any activity have on the human security is a very important part. And in that sense, uh, uh, guiding principle for the uh, business and the human rights uh, certainly uh, put forward a certain concept that, you know, well, how the each activity could connect to the violation of human rights. And uh, I think. Uh, uh, if we think greenwashing in terms of uh, 
uh, human security, that concept is very important. And so, uh, uh, well, is it, is it a direct environment or the indirect or the just influencing through kind of indirect channel? All, all those things need to be considered. But uh, uh, well, um, and uh, with that kind of level of involvement with the human security, uh, probably the level of responsibility will vary. So, so that the kind of thinking uh, I, I, I have uh, in, in terms of your question. Thank you. Um, we're going to, uh, so just on, on that point, the UN recently did uh, make a communication, a public communication um, to some oil companies and banks regarding the intersection of human rights, climate change, and greenwashing. Um, so please check that out. Um, I wanted to give the uh, closing remarks. I believe Harry Cho, um, is she here? She's not here. Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, we're going to close um, the forum because I, I see people uh, wanting to get over to the PRI. Um, but yes. Well, it's an important question. Uh, and it's a question that was not really addressed. Uh, so I'm uh, someone who writes about competence greenwashing. So uh, in Japan, and I want to ask the uh, participants, uh, so competence greenwashing is like the misrepresentation of uh, ESG and sustainability related skills. And uh, the inflation and now organizations and even practitioners want to highlight their green credentials uh, because the industry is moving that way. So in Japan, what I observed is a lot of institutions, there's like now a head of sustainability, head of ESG. And when you look at their track records, there's usually communications or marketing. And that is what a lot of these positions are. But we talk about complex things like climate. Biodiversity is now the latest trend. Those are extremely complex. I'm an environmental scientist by trade, and I know even just a little bit about my field, and I need to collaborate. But suddenly, financial institutions who are not traditionally in science or natural science now deal with or are supposed to deal with very complex topics and make very complex investments in those. How do you feel about is Japan on a good track or are a lot of the head of sustainabilities, how is it with the positions that we see? Uh, do you see there's a risk of competence greenwashing or are all the heads of responsibility, head of ESG, head of biodiversity or head of climate very well how do I say, do they have the expertise to carry out what uh, the organizations advertise? That um, is my question. If I may, thank you for the question. If I may designate Onozuka-san to, to answer that question, and then we're going to close. Thanks, Kim, <laughs> for injecting that. Um, I, I do see a risk there, so we must recognize. But we also need to give a break that this is only a starting. That I think we need to embrace this, even this concept is kind of getting into the financial institution, this, this country. So um, we just need to be careful. And one, one quick advertisement is that my NPO, the Future Design by Science and Finance, is providing a sponsorship, the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the Shogakin, um, to those who want to upgrade their knowledge in these fields. So please look into the homepage, and if you're interested, please all right, well, um, with that, we're going to close. If everybody could join me in giving the panelists a round of applause. Thank you very much for coming. Regarding your bento boxes, um, please feel free to either leave it on the table or there's boxes outside. You can drop them off. Thank you very much. Um, please do remember to return your translation devices and do not take it home with you. Thank you.